Right, today I want to continue with the book of Hebrews, and chapter 3 is what we're going to be looking at today, and the focus is going to be our heavenly calling, our heavenly calling, and it's really important that we understand that we actually have a heavenly calling. Brief recap, the, this book was written to Hebrew people, people who really understood Judaism and were entrenched in it. The author is unknown. Probably written by Paul, I suspect, who I think, but can't be proven, but who I think didn't sign it because he knew he, he was somebody who was perceived as a betrayer of Judaism and a farayer, and so he wanted not, he didn't want to influence the arguments in any way by his personality and who he was, but rather let them stand in their own rabbinical logic. And they, it is an incredibly well-written book, the beautiful flow of logic arguing why Jesus Christ is the supreme Messiah against Moses and why the new covenant is so much greater than the old covenant. So that's the, the book also. It highlights, and I shared much on this in, in chapter two, the humanity of Jesus and why he came as a man because as a man, he was showing us not just how to live, but if you remember, the world, the inheritance of the world, it was given to man to, to rule and govern in the beginning. But it was lost through our mistrust of God and our being deceived by the enemy and taking it into our own hands and et cetera, et cetera. And when it was lost, it was usurped and it was taken over by Satan and his demons because he calls himself the prince of the power of the air. That's what Jesus refers to him as. But Jesus comes as a man to rule and reign as a man in the midst of his enemies and to regain it as a man because it was originally given to man by God. So the humanity of Jesus is important. That's why he came as a man. So and then he invites us to co-rule and co-reign with him in this inheritance which is of all nations. But today... We're going to focus on chapter 3. So let's have a look at some scripture. Therefore, holy brothers, brothers and sisters, holy brothers and sisters, you who share in a heavenly calling, all of you, brothers and sisters, you share in a heavenly calling. Consider Jesus, the apostle, and high priest of our confession. Christians, you have a confession. The mouth speaks what the heart believes. Consider him of our confession who was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in all God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. Now Moses, now we sometimes think all these little words and phrases and parentheses that aren't that important. There's a reason why they put everything there. It's inspired by the Holy Spirit. It all makes sense in the argument. Um, now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant to testify to the things that were to be spoken later. He was just proclaiming the coming of the great gospel and demonstrating it. That was fantastic. I just did that by pure accident. <laughs> but Christ is faithful over God's house, not in God's house, over God's house as a son, not a servant. And we are his, this house, we are his house, if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. All right, so now we're going to go through a few points. The first one is this, holy brothers and sisters, we, believe it or not, are considered by God to be holy. No matter what you think, no matter what you feel, he thinks you are holy. Holy doesn't mean that you're this p 
perfect human being who never makes a mistake. Holy means that you are different to others. Why? Because by the Spirit of God, you've been born again. You're not, you're not just born of flesh. You're born of the Spirit. There's a recreation that's gone on inside, and God's incorruptible seed has been implanted, and now there's a fruitful growing from that incorruptible seed by the Spirit through grace. And so you are now different to the world. You're not just an earthling. I wake up sometimes, and I just feel like 100% earthling. I sometimes have a thought, and I'm horrified by that thought. How can I think that? I'm a child of God. And I can sometimes feel like, gosh, I am so useless. I don't know, none of you feel like that. <laughs> but God, because of Jesus, has said, I, through my Son, will make atonement for the sins of the world, and by this perfect sacrifice, all sins will be covered, both past, present, and future. And whoever believes in me, in him, and what he did, enters into a new covenant where you are declared righteous, holy, and beloved, holy, different, not just of the world. Don't be deceived into thinking you are merely of this world. Because as a man thinks in his heart, so is he. But as a man believes in his heart and starts to confess what he believes, so he starts to live differently because we actually act out what we believe, not what we think we believe. What do we believe? Are we holy? Because God says, holy brothers and sisters. Next verse. Who share in a heavenly calling. All the brothers and sisters, all who are declared holy by God's goodness, all share in a heavenly calling. We think, well, pr prophets, evangelists, apostles, pastors, teachers, heavenly calling, yeah. Yeah, sure, that's a different thing. This is holy brothers and sisters, all who share in a heavenly calling. Every child of God has a heavenly calling. It's the same calling. This, this is the same heavenly calling. This is all the beloved sons and daughters of God, many being brought to glory through Christ. All of us share in the heavenly calling, this heavenly calling. Consider Jesus, the next verse says. Consider Jesus. In other words, if you want to know more about this heavenly calling, consider Jesus the Apostle and high priest, the sent one. He's going to give us an indication of what this heavenly calling is. But I feel, and I sense prophetically this morning, that so many Christians feel disqualified from fully engaging and participating in this heavenly calling. So many Christians feel on the back foot when it comes to a heavenly calling. So many Christians have allowed criticism or disillusionment or obstacles or hindrances or whatever, financial pressures or whatever it is to get in the way of this heavenly calling. And I feel in the spirit God wants to remind the church, you all have a heavenly calling. Yeah. And it's a beautiful calling from God to come and participate in this heavenly calling. Yeah. And no one is disqualified who believes in Christ. And nothing you even do necessarily has to disqualify you from this heavenly calling. Oh, rest assured, choices we make can complicate this heavenly calling. We'll talk about that just now, hopefully, if I get time. And rest assured, other things can make it difficult. But rest assured, the only time we stop or, the, the, okay, let me say it like this. The only time we cease to participate in this heavenly calling is up to us. If we step back and don't participate. If we believe the lie that we don't qualify. So I want to, I want to encourage you right now. Let this heart not become hard. Let this heart not become bitter. Let this heart not become offended and angry. 
Because that's what will really complicate this heavenly calling. Let the heart be pure before God. Just, just surrender. Just, God, I really, really got hurt by that. God, I, I really, really felt pain. But you know what? That is not going to stop me from this heavenly calling that I have received as a child of God. All of you have a heavenly calling. And God is excited that every one of his children participate in this heavenly calling. Yeah. This heavenly calling is not a calling to go to heaven. Yeah. It's not, I can't wait for the eject button. I just got to get out of this horrible world because people are so horrible. As evil as this world is, this heavenly calling is for you to do what Jesus was doing. Consider Jesus the apostle, the sent one, with the calling from God, who came and demonstrated what, it's look, what it looks like to live this heavenly calling, yeah. no matter what people did. It's not a calling to go to heaven. It's a calling to bring heaven to earth. Yeah. It's a calling to manifest the things of heaven on earth, just like Jesus did. That's what he did. In the middle, the world didn't suddenly become beautiful and sweet when Jesus came, it was still hostile. The Romans were still ruling. They were still, it was still hectic. Yeah. But in the midst of his enemies, he ruled. Yeah. Yeah. That ruling doesn't mean you sit on a throne and you make everybody do what you say. That ruling means no matter what people do, this kingdom of God, this other way of living, this world of peace, and joy and righteousness isn't compromised, but it comes out towards you no matter what you do. Yeah. That's the heavenly calling, to consider Jesus. It's to bring something of heaven to earth, and he manifested it no matter what. You and I, like Jesus, and I'll show you just now, this, there's an, another a very clear scripture to back it up, because scriptures aren't isolated. God's got this amazing meta-narrative, and everything is, is woven together for this beautiful gospel message. Yeah to change the world. And um, I forgot what was I going to say. <laughs> Let me just go back to this. So Jesus steps into the world with a heavenly calling. Broken people were healed in his presence. That's a part of the heavenly calling. Disillusioned people, hurt people, offended people. He never compromised truth. He never backed down from truth, but he only ever spoke truth in love. Because love is the most powerful way of living. Yeah. And he manifested love. Love is not soft. Love is, in, steadfast love is incredibly tenacious. It is relentless. It does not give up. That's why it's steadfast love and faithfulness. Yeah. And no matter what, he brought this kingdom to bear upon people's lives. And just look at the fruit of people's lives who drew close to Jesus and their hearts softened. Look at how lives changed. From Mary Magdalene, the woman at the well, the woman caught in adultery, Peter, James, on and on it goes. Just people's lives were changed. Brothers and sisters who share in a heavenly calling. Yeah. Don't forget when you wake up, you have a heavenly calling. Monday is Mission Monday. Tuesday is Mission Tuesday. Yeah, no alliteration. Yeah. Wednesday is Mission Wednesday. Thursday is Mission Thursday. On and on it goes. Yeah. We are a missional people. I sometimes talk to people and I say we're a missional church. Whatever. No, it's a big word, missional. It means we're on a mission. It doesn't mean we're going to India next week necessarily. It just means every day we wake up sharing in a heavenly calling. I'm not just going to work to earn a salary. Yeah. I am on a mission to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth because I share in a heavenly calling. Yeah. Imagine the world re uh, um, being influenced by Christians who believed they were on a mission yeah. every day. Not just on their own agenda, not just on their own mission, but on a heavenly mission to bring the kingdom of heaven to earth. How? Not because we're special, but because he has qualified us and invited us to share in a heavenly calling and empowered us with his Holy Spirit. Yeah. Do you not know that your body is the temple of God? 
And all we do is we say, God, here's my humanity, a living sacrifice. Use me today. I look in the mirror, and I just think, oh, there's a little mark here, and there's a little thing there, and when I run, sometimes a little ache here. And, but God, here's my body, yeah. a, living, a living sacrifice, a temple. And, and I just want to perpetually do that. Glorious surrender to God. Then the world gets to meet Christians who are on a mission with Jesus, empowered by the Spirit, and not just doing their own thing. What's the greatest enemy to this mission? Is living for self. Being consumed with self. Yes, you know, Naaman is important. His humanity is important, even to Jesus. He says, look at the birds of the air. I clothe them. I look after the flowers. Don't worry what you're going to eat and drink and wear. He says, but seek first my kingdom and my righteousness, and all these things that I know you need will be added to you. It's just a reorientation of I'm on a heavenly mission. I share in a heavenly calling. And our tendency is to forget and to be consumed with what we think and feel and see all the time. And not to be, that's why for me, I, I love to be recentered and refocused every morning. It realigns me with why I'm alive today and God, what are the purposes and opportunities today? Holy Spirit, help me to do what you've called me to do. If we don't realign ourselves with truth, if we aren't reminding ourselves continually of God's spirit-infused truth, it's easy to forget. I mean, sometimes we forget each other's names. Yeah. And we know, them, we know people so well. We see them coming up. It's like, <laughs> no time to phone a friend. If we can forget a name of somebody we know, how easy is it to forget the beautiful truth of God that shapes us for the world on a mission where we're not continually allowing the Spirit to remind us of it and realigning ourselves with it. It becomes dangerous. We, we, we can, uh, in fact, let me say that now. We can complicate this heavenly calling by choices that we make. I'll, I'll say this right out now. Who you marry will either complement or complicate your heavenly calling. True, true story. Yeah, true. true story. Don't over-spiritualize it that no matter who I marry, it's going to be awesome. We're going to serve Jesus together. <laughs> what business partnership, whatever partnership you go into, whether it be business, relational, whatever partnership has got a massive influence on either complementing or complicating this heavenly calling. It doesn't make it impossible because nothing makes it impossible, yeah. but it can make it harder. You can still do it and do it well, but it either can be easier or it can be harder. And when we, when we think of self and we're consumed with self and we don't always like, do it like, outrightly like, oh, I'm, just, I'm just such a selfish person. <laughs> I'm living for myself. We don't do it like that. We just find ourselves making choices continually that are self-comforting, complicates the message and the calling. Self, people self-medicate. Not necessarily by popping pills and tablets, but we self-medicate. We're feeling in this way, so we want to make ourselves feel better, so we do this. Maybe we buy this, or maybe we watch that on TV, or maybe, and the whole time we're self-medicating. Anything to do with self isn't enriching in the spirit, because your self addition isn't as fulfilling as the Spirit of God's work in our lives. And so when I'm feeling bad, what is it? the words of a song came to me now as I said that. <laughs> when, I, when I'm feeling blue. <laughs> so so when, when um, I'm feeling in a way that I'm not like, oh, I'm so earthly or I'm so weak, or, what do you do? Whatever you choose, will either enhance or complicate the heavenly calling. Not disqualify you necessarily. I'm not saying that. Not take you out of the game. No. But just affect how you participate in the glorious calling to share something of heaven on this earth that God has called us to. We're called to deny ourselves, lay down our lives, and follow him. 
and live for Him, no longer for ourselves, but for Him. You see, a scripture that reminds us of this is in John. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. This is John's first letter, chapter two. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. And it's specifically talking about things in the world, yeah? For all that is in the world, the desires of the flesh and the desires of the eyes and the pride of life is not from the Father, but is from the world. Wanting what you see, wanting to fulfill what you desire right now, what you crave. That feeling of, I can do this, I've done it, I'll do it again. That self, I've done it, I've got what it takes. All of that is of the world. It's not from the Father. And the world is passing away along with its desires, but whoever does the will of God abides forever. So God's encouragement to us is this. You who share in the heavenly calling, do not set your mind on things on earth, but rather set your mind on things in heaven where Christ is seated at the right hand of God so that you're continually reminded of this heavenly calling that you participate in. Consider Jesus the apostle and high priest of our confession. So he's the high priest. We're going to hear more about that in Hebrews as it goes along. So I'm not going to spend much time there other than he is the, the perfect high priest made atonement for our sins. Propitiation, it's all done, covered. Peace with God, that's ours now. And the apostle. Now this is important because of that train of thought. You share in a heavenly calling, consider Jesus the apostle. Because he is the, you know what apostle means? Simple, it's a simple word. It wasn't a religious word, by the way. It was a commonly used word in the day. It means somebody who is sent on behalf of somebody else to represent them and manifest their will and their intentions in that space. So Jesus was sent by God. Who will go for us? Here I am, send me. I will go and I will show the world what you look like and I will represent you on earth. Whoever sees me will see you, Father, because I will only ever do what you tell me to do. And he represents God and he brings the kingdom of God, the will of God into this place so that people go, ah, you're representing another. And he said, I, I represent my father. And then he says, now consider him, Jesus, the apostle, in your heavenly calling. Think about what that means for you. He came not to do his own will, but the will of his Father. He was sent with the authority of God, with the anointing of the Spirit. Though he was a man, he was filled with the fullness of the deity, the fullness of God in him, and the Spirit without measure. But as a man, he went into the world to represent the Father. Christian, just like you and me, you are a man and a woman. And you are called by God to be filled with the Spirit of God, and the fullness of God is pleased to dwell in you through Christ Jesus. Not because of anything you've done, but because of His goodness yeah. and His grace. And you go now with His authority to represent Him as Jesus, our great apostle, did. Same type of calling. Thank God we're not called to die on a cross for each other. It would be an absolute failure. The cross would be empty. But He did it for love. But we're called to follow in this same calling of representing the Father, showing the world what God is like. And you can't show the world what God is like if you don't really know God. You can't show the world what God is like if you're not fellowshipping with the Spirit of God. If you're not daily enjoying the presence of God in you. You, can't, you, you can only give away what you've got. So consider Jesus the apostle, the sent one, who manifested God's kingdom in the face of sickness, death, darkness, demons, disappointment, betrayal, hatred, criticism, hardship, suffering. Nothing would stop that kingdom from coming. God, I want to be anointed to do the same thing. He said this scripture after he had been after he had died and been resurrected, he meets with his disciples. He appears to them. He says, peace be with you. As the Father has sent me, the great apostle, as the Father has sent me, so I am sending you. 
Disciples, you are sent. Christians, you are sent by God into the world to represent him. Share in a heavenly calling. All of us, without exception. Who was faithful, this Jesus, this great apostle and high priest, was faithful to him who appointed him. Say faithful. faithful. It's, such, it's such a beautiful, powerful word, faithful. It's, you, know when you, fa- you know why people love their pets so much? Because they're faithful. Yeah. Like, like, they just, like they just don't give up coming back. Yeah. They're just always coming back. Even when you get irritated with them, just come back. They're faithful. They've got steadfast love. Jesus has the most incredible faithfulness to his Father and to us. This incredible steadfast love. So he he was faithful to him who appointed him, just as Moses was also faithful in God's house. For Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses. This is a common Um, thread throughout Hebrews, Jesus is superior to all men, including Moses. Now, why Moses? Because Moses was the pinnacle of Hebrew leadership. You think King David was great, which he was. Moses was the deliverer leader who rescued Israel out of Egypt from Pharaoh's clutches after years of slavery, who demonstrated powerful miracles before Pharaoh and the others. That, that plague, literally, I mean, it shocked, it, shocked, um, it shocked Egypt. Then he said Israel. It shocked Egypt. He says, just get out of my country, just go. And then they get to the Red Sea, and Moses, the Red Sea opens with a staff. I mean, Moses was a powerful leader. Then in the wilderness, rock, water flows from a rock. This, this is not common. This is Moses. They held Moses in the highest of honor. The Passover was the celebration of the Exodus. It was the big deal. He says the following. Just as Moses also was faithful in all God's house, for Jesus has been counted worthy of more glory than Moses, as much more glory as the builder of a house has more honor than the house itself. The imagination and the vision and the intellect of the one who makes and creates a house or a project, that's much greater than the project or the house itself. But look what he says next. For every house is built by someone, but the builder of all things is God. This is an allusion to the fact that actually a man creates a house. Moses was just a man. Jesus was more faithful than Moses. He was faithful in a house, but actually he's the creator of the house. He's the owner and the possessor of all things. Um, Now Moses was faithful in all God's house as a servant. What's the deal about a servant? A servant can be faithful. They can really do their job well, really do it with honor, really serve and lay down their lives. But a servant never shares in the inheritance. It's not theirs to own. They serve and they get paid. But a son in the house knows that this house is my inheritance. This is my future. Whatever I invest in is for my future. I am absolutely invested in this. So he says, Moses was faithful in God's house as a servant. Jesus is faithful over God's house, which, by the way, he created and sustains as a son, meaning he is so faithful that he cannot deny himself or you because you are his inheritance. Yeah. And why would he do, why would he hurt himself? This Jesus, when he was dying on the cross, it's the Hebrews 12 says, for the joy set before him, he endured the cross yeah. because he saw his inheritance. He saw the many sons and daughters coming to glory through the sacrifice. So it was, this is my inheritance. Psalm 2 Jesus says to the Father, ask of me and I will give you the nations as your inheritance. We the people are his inheritance. That's why he is so faithful in this house, over this house. It belongs to him. And he cannot be unfaithful because he cannot deny himself. 
So you, therefore, as a child of God, holy and beloved, sharing in this heavenly calling, have a faithful high priest and apostle who is going to be so faithful to you that no matter what you do, he is committed to finishing what he began. That's the faithfulness of this God. That's the faithfulness of Jesus. That's why he's so much greater than Moses. All right, let's start to end off here. I've learned from the first meeting. I don't have the scripture. The last part of the scripture is this. And we are his house. And we are his house if indeed we hold fast our confidence and our boasting in our hope. And we are this house that belongs to him that he's faithful over, that he's absolutely committed to, that he will finish what he began if, if we hold fast our hope, our confidence in this hope. In other words, there is a partnership here. So the bottom line is this. No matter what you do, God's not going to change his mind. But you can change yours. Because God doesn't control us. So I've got a choice to either keep on believing the gospel, keep on being moored to the gospel, keep on having the gospel wash over my mind and, re- and renew my mind so that I'm not thinking the ways of the world, but I'm reminded of this heavenly calling, or I can choose to just become a bit unmoored, and all I will do is I will drift away from the purity and simplicity of this glorious gospel. So he says, keep on in that confession. Remember that confession he said earlier? You have a confession. Christian, you have a confession. It means, actually, Christians are not called to be these silent witnesses. We're called to have a confession. Our confession is, Jesus Christ is Lord. That's it. That's our confession. It's all about Jesus. He is the Son of God. He is the Messiah. What the, what the heart believes, the mouth speaks. And I say, you indeed have this calling. Just continue to be in this calling. Just continue to be in the gospel. Just continue to stay moored to the gospel and continue to declare and to confess what you believe because that's our witness to the world. If you stop, if you stop confessing Jesus, if you stop believing in him, God's not going to stop loving you. His love for you is steadfast and faithful. And you can come back at any time and he will welcome you as a son and a daughter because that's how good he is. But I encourage you, don't. Keep in this heavenly calling. Keep in this gospel. Keep living this out. Steadfast love and faithfulness. Last scripture. Proverbs chapter three says, let steadfast love and faithfulness not be forsaken by you. Bind it around your neck. Write it. Tattoo it on the tablets of your heart. Then you will find good favor with God and man. Steadfast love and faithfulness. It is vital in the kingdom dynamics of how we live. There's nothing greater than steadfast love. Nothing. If you find it, come and tell me. Maybe I'll come follow you rather than Jesus. Steadfast love and faithfulness, and you will find favor. If any of you have ever employed somebody, it's a, it's a lovely privilege employing people. No matter how gifted somebody is, no matter how talented they are, no matter how much value they say they can add, the moment they become unfaithful and not steadfast, Houston, we have a problem. This Jesus will give you no problem. He is steadfast and faithful. And may we understand the power of the, His steadfast love that by our Spirit gets poured into our hearts and that faithfulness that comes of being rooted and established in the gospel. Mm. Share, you share in this heavenly calling. So let's stand. <laughs>